Our fourth panel, panel are Voices in Mentoring and Program Development. Um, so as Ahada mentioned, I'm Allie Riley, and I am the Senior Vice President of Programming and Evaluation at Girls on the Run International. So during this panel, we'll hear from these amazing women who have led or worked with girl-focused programs and programs and companies that are geared towards mentoring women in sports. Before I pass the baton to our moderator, Luella Provenza, Chief Development Officer for Up to Us Sports, I have the honor of introducing our panelists for this evening. First, we have Lori Hicks, a rock star volunteer for Girls on the Run, serving as both a coach for 10 seasons and a national coach ambassador. She's also the ambassador for the San Antonio chapter of Black Girls Run, serving a membership of over 1,600 women. Liz Coons has been the CEO for Girls on the Run International since 2008. She brings a significant expertise to Girls on the Run in setting strategic direction and creating an inclusive culture of empowerment, gratitude, and joyful pur purpose. And I can personally attest to the incredible cult culture that she's created at Girls on the Run. Angela LaChica, who was our keynote earlier this afternoon, is president and CEO of LaChica Sports and Entertainment, a women-led sports consulting firm. LCS specializes in social impact, philanthropy, and sport management. She's consulted for major sports pro properties, leading nonprofit organizations, and many of the top professional athletes in the world. Angela has been a pioneer force behind social just justice advocacy. Penny Lucas White, who just moderated an incredible panel right before this, is a former USA national volleyball player and the current head volleyball coach at Alabama State University. She's entering her 10th season um, with ASU and has won multiple championships under her leadership. She's also the proud founder of Play Like Winners, Inc. Lonnie Silversides is a former collegiate basketball player and the founder and chief empowerment officer for SG United Foundation, a nonprofit with a mission to empower girls to be strong, confident, and resilient. Through her consulting mindful performance in her nonprofit, Lonnie specializes in the intersection of sport and positive psychology to fuel performance and well being. And last but certainly not least, um, Kim, Kim Vanderberg is an up to us sports ambassador and Olympic bronze medalist in swimming. Kim continues to promote women in sports as a contributing writer for the Women's Sports Foundation, serves as a mentor for Rise Athletes, an ambassador for Room to Read, and an ambassador for Kids Play International. Obviously, we're going to have a very, very fruitful discussion here, and I know I'm excited about it, but I'm going to pass it over to Luella um, to take it from there. Thanks so much, Ali. Um, I just want to thank everyone for being here um, and on this panel. I'm super excited to be moderating. So with this, um, I will jump right in. Um, and my first question is around what is the biggest responsibility um, that you may have as a mentor or even a program developer? And, and Ms. Penny, I'm going to start with you because I sat in on the last session um, and you spoke specifically about um, being a gatekeeper and holding the gate open for the next generation of women. So I think we'll start with you and then um, we will pass it over to Lonnie. I totally agree. I think I am a gatekeeper. I come from a family of seven boys. I was the only girl and it took a um, plethora of women through my journey who actually guided me and helped me become the woman I am today. I think it's important that we truly bridge relationships with mentees, even if they haven't um, establish the fact that they are our mentee because we as coaches are mentoring and molding young women even when we least expect it. I think through the development of relationships and just kind of nudging them to be great is important. And I, I you know, with my, with my own uh, travel volleyball team, I don't just train young girls to be excellent volleyball players. I'm truly in it to train them to be leaders, that when they step out of my program, they one will be assertive enough to be able to articulate what they need and what they want and what they desire and what's not good. Two, that they would be self-confident enough to know that they can do and be anything that they desire as long as they're willing to put the work in. And three, to know that they'll always have a soft place to fall 
And that would be coming back to me as a mentor or a former coach or a confidant so somebody can continue to pour wisdom through them. Thanks, Penny. Lonnie? Do you want me to jump right in? Yeah, I agree with everything that Penny just said. I love that. Um, the other thing I was thinking about is, I like someone, something that Penny said that I was thinking about as she was talking is how much mentoring happens without necessarily the official role, right? And so I 100% I agree with everything she just said. And, and that's been a, a big part of um, you know, I, I teach actually at the high school, I have a high school math teacher and a high school coach in addition to the nonprofit stuff. And there's so much mentoring that happens in that process of teaching and coaching. In terms of particular program development, something that I've been really mindful of is making sure that we have programs and curriculum and content and support for both the mentors and mentees. And that I think is just something to be, you know, when I was thinking about what is the biggest responsibility, I think, you know, we think about raising the next generation and, and empowering the next generation of young girls. And my focus is on that and on continually empowering those leaders that are serving as mentors as well and giving them some tools to go through that process. And sometimes I'm finding, so one of our programs, we, we pair college athletes with elementary or middle school girls. And what I'm finding with the college athletes is sometimes they actually get as much or more out of the experience than the young kids do. So that's just something that I, I always have on my mind is that responsibility. It's not just, hey, college athletes, here's this responsibility you have to you know, work with these young girls. It's also my responsibility to work with the college athletes and the high school athletes that, that kind of serve in these roles to help them through their process as well. Great, thank you so much. Angela, I'm, I'm hoping we can come to you next um, with the same question because you were speaking um, earlier in the panel, can't remember if it was today or yesterday, but um, you are leading a, a company in which you are employ employing nothing but women. And so I'm hoping you can speak to your role as a mentor in shaping the industry. Sure. Um, you know, when we were talking about this earlier, sometimes I need to be careful when I say that I only hire women, but it is what it is. And I think that we need to look out for each other. And it is, it's one of the proudest moments in my career being able to give back to women in this industry, whether it is that unofficial title is mentoring. Um, I, I, there's 11 of us who work um, on this, on our, in our company, all women, you know, we're working moms and we're all over the place. Um, and it's, it's something that our clients have also um, showed that they're proud of that too and to support that. Um, but I think the exposure to opportunity has always been something that has been important to me, whether it's inviting an unofficial mentee, which I love that, I love that categorization of it, to an event or having them shadow me just for a day and just to meet people and just to understand how you sit through a business lunch or even this, this webinar, you know, I've shared it with a bunch of unofficial mentees and just so they're exposed to different things and start to understand how really, you know, the, 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 how big the world is out there in this industry and the opportunities for them. Great, thank you so much. So my next question, I wanna um, take it with Liz um, and Lori and specifically talk about um, a little bit about your programs and how y'all are helping find uh, young girls and women find their voice. And if you can speak a little bit to the work that you're doing in the field. Sure, absolutely. Um, so Allie mentioned earlier uh, when she was telling a little bit about Girls on the Run as we started the symposium today, um, we work with elementary school girls and we serve over 200,000 girls a year. Um, so when I think about our responsibility to these girls, you know, there are three things that are critically important to us. First of all, we want them to have fun, right? I mean, they are at a time in their life when they're learning about critical life skills and they're building this lifelong love of physical activity. So we really want them to having activities that encourage and support friendship and teamwork. And we know that that's what girls love the most in teams, their camaraderie. And it's also critical to us to give them a mastery-based climate. You know, we know that, um, and really what this means is that it is not about winning. It is not about who is the elite athlete. And oh my gosh, we've heard some from so many elite athletes today. 
and I know we've got elite athletes listening in. Um, and the reason you're so inspiring is it's just really hard to reach your level of excellence. So we, it, we are fundamentally invested in providing a mastery climate where we focus on personal improvement and always doing your best. And everyone is celebrated for their effort and the focus is not on comparison or who is the fastest or the strongest or the most agile or whatever. And our final responsibility is designing our programs to be accessible and inclusive to any girl, no matter her background, her circumstances, her ability to pay or her physical or cognitive abilities. You know, we serve girls from all walks of life. So when we think about how do we want them to find their voice through our programming, I mean, that just relates so powerfully to everything we are because, you know, one of our core values is to um, stand up for yourself and others. And I kind of want to give you an example from our curriculum just to help you understand how a, a way we do that. So one of our uh, lessons in our curriculum for our heart and soul girls is called power and agency. And that's where girls discuss the power they have to act on their own behalf and on the behalf of others. And so we use scenarios, you know, again, remember, we're working with younger girls. Um, so we give them scenarios to think about, well, how would I use agency? So it might be your teacher made a mistake and gave you a lower grade than you earned, or you see a classmate making fun of another classmate and calling her names, or maybe you uh, found out that someone you thought was your friend was talking behind your back. So the girls will play a game of tag because again, we're incorporating physical activity. Um, well, they'll think through, well, how would I re respond to that? How would I stand up in that situation? And then the lesson ends with the team discussing times when they personally maybe had a, something difficult to speak up about. Um, and they problem solve together, like how could we potentially solve that? And what I love so much about Girls on the Run is that, you know, maybe a girl hasn't specifically experienced a situation like that in their lives yet, but we're giving them um, a lesson or it's like a toolkit, right? And so when you go through a scenario like that, then you're going to remember it so that when something happens in the future, um, you're going to be able to really effectively manage it. You'll remember that, and you'll think about your tools, and you'll, you'll be able to respond more appropriately. And um, Lori's a coach for Girls on the Run, so I hate to put you on the spot, but I would just love to hear your perspective on, you know, very specific examples you've seen um, with girls finding their voice through the program. Sure. Um, well, for the girls on the run side of it, um, our curriculum lesson is bystander versus stand by her. Um, and this um, part of the lesson, again, just like heart and soul, teaches the girls how to stand up for themselves and for others. Um, when they come into um, our meeting space, I like to let them know right offhand that it is a safe space for them. So if they're experiencing anything in school, in a certain class, or maybe even at home, this is a place where they can talk about it. Um, and as a team, if they're willing to share, um, we can help them come up with ways to address the situation if it's something that they're personally going through, or maybe they've seen somebody else who doesn't have their voice yet, how to help them out. And then once they learn this lesson, it's a tool that they've now put in their toolbox. Hopefully they teach it out to their classmates or other family members. And so now you've got a group of young women that are learning to stand up for themselves and others. And that's just an empowerment move um, that's starting out in the third, the fourth, the fifth grade. And if that continues on through their life, we've got a group of leaders that are ready to take over the world. I would love to jump on the toolkit um, concept. Really? I love that so much. And it's something that I, I wished as a college athlete that I had more access to the, the mental skills, the mental skills toolbox. It was like, it was it was basketball and it was practice and it was weightlifting and you know all the skills and I it was missing that and so that was a big reason why I started these programs and when I was really looking at the girls dropout rate from women's sport you know all the research from women's sports foundation and thinking I know that that dropout rate is uh, when I started these programs was six times the rate of boys at age 13 now it's twice but I was thinking you know we got to backtrack we can't just 
start there. We've got to start young, like what Girls on the Run is doing, start in the elementary school and start giving these tools. Maybe they don't need them now, but I, you know, we always, I talk about an invisible backpack all the time, right? Like put it in the, vis in, in the invisible backpack. Someday you're going to probably need it. And I do the same exact thing with my high school varsity athletes. And as they go into play college sports, like, hey, these are some tools you're gonna need. You're gonna need these at some point. So like fill up your backpack. And so I just love that analogy so much. And I think it's important. You know, I, I, I can't wait to see some of these elementary school girls that have, the, you know, learn these tools and what happens, how does it shape their life 15 years from now or 20 years from now? And a quick personal story, these, when I started uh, learning and teaching these tools and incorporating them into whether it was high school varsity coaching or these, you know, kindergartners that were in our programs, I also went through um, two years ago, was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so uh, we're still in October, breast cancer awareness month. So, you know, that was, you know, I'm as a, a, you know, an athlete and I was healthy and going through that treatment, I felt like I had all these tools, like everything I just learned that I was going to be putting into these programs. I was like, I got my backpack. I'm good. Like I can do this, you know? And so to me, that really became such an important thing where I, it was like, I got these tools because of sports, because of team, you know, all the things that I learned through sport, plus all of these mental skills, you know, were so important in a life situation. And like what you said, Liz, about that connection of, of program to life, um, it's just so important. So I, I love the toolbox analogy and we use it, we use it often as well. And I, I truly feel, and I have two young daughters, you can't start that early enough. You know, why not start at five years old and six years old? Like we can start building that, that bridge and that toolbox for them. Thank you for that. I, I, I want to stick on the theme of, of invisible backpacks. And so as you guys know, we have um, a variety of people watching in on this and some are including young girls, high school girls and, and college girls. And so I'm, I'm wondering what advice would you give to them about, um, you know, finding their place in the world, finding their next step? Um, because I think there's an element um, throughout this that I've seen um, in the panelists even saying that they found their confidence later in life. Um, and so I'm curious of what tools would you put in the invisible pack of the, the folks that are that are watching at home today? I think one of the things, I guess I just assume I could talk. I'm sorry. No, go for it, Penny. <laughs> <laughs> I think dealing with uh, young women and I, I'm, gosh, I spent 28 seasons now. The one thing, I don't just train them, their physicality. I think it's very important that we train the mentality. And it's just what all these women are saying here. But the, the way that you, I believe that you really get them where iron is sharpening iron, that you make them cognizant of their self-talk. Because that is the one person that they're having a conversation with the entire day is ongoing is with themselves and so i think it's very important that once i made them conscientious of what are you saying to yourself and when they really pull the mask down and be honest with you and tell you what they're literally are saying to themselves whether it's in competition whether they're sitting in math class and the teacher asks what about this equation and she won't raise her hand but yet she is the smartest kid in the class where guys are more assertive i ask what are you saying to yourself and when we talk about that dialogue i talk about them understanding that they completely have power over their dialogue and so we teach them the i am statements we teach them to recognize when that negative thought comes you don't have to refute it. You just recognize it and let it pass. But once you become cognizant of your self-talk and you change that to a positive self-talk, then half the battle is won. Because th that's where we're defeating ourselves as women. You know, with women in sports, you know, let's say I can, I'm playing basketball. I shoot 10 baskets. I make seven baskets. I'm going to complain about the three that I missed. That's what we do as women. And guys, they can shoot 10 baskets and only make one. They go, did you see that basket I made? 
They're going to just talk about that one. And if we could just take that tool and put it in our backpack and make sure that we applaud ourselves where appropriate and make sure that we kind of give ourselves a pass. That is critical in growing young girls into strong leaders. So that's, the, that's my niche. I really love uh, just uh, engaging them on their, the power of their self-talk. I do. I uh, completely, completely agree with that, Penny. And I, as I think about uh, the, the invisible backpack, I mean, I also think it's, it's helping girls recognize we all have inner strength, right? We all have it. So how do we build our confidence in ourselves? And we build confidence by trying new things, right? And sometimes we don't succeed, right? But the, the, the real power comes from trying again. You know, you fall down 10 times, you get up 10 times. You, you keep trying. So the, the end of season 5K that our girls do, you know, that's such a confidence building aha moment because our girls really do realize with effort and with determination, I can accomplish my goals. And hey, if I can do this, if I can run, I never thought I could run a 5K. If I, if I can run a 5K, what else can I do? So again, trying to do the thing, trying to do the things that you just didn't think were possible to do. And again, to your point, just getting rid of those, I couldn't, I shouldn't, ugh, you know, all that energy about, you know, oh, I'm not good enough. We, we just, that garbage just has to go away. It just has to go away. So reflection, you know, self-awareness, being aware of who you are, understanding the things you're passionate about, and really recognizing you are the author of your story and the leader of your life. So you follow your path, you know, you follow your path, whatever it may be, and don't let the haters or the negative people or anybody else get in your way. Great, thank you. Um, Kim, I'm gonna start with you and then um, maybe move to Angela on this. I, I'm curious from your perspective, um, how has the landscape of girls focused programming changed over the 10 years? Um, and I'm curious of where do you want to see it go to in terms of its evolution? So I believe that when 10 years ago, I feel like we didn't have the programs that we have today. And as a mentor and as an advocate for women in sports, I'm really optimistic to see all the changes, to see panels like this existing. I just got off a call. Um, it was it, women in tech overcoming obstacles, you know, destroying gender bias. And it's really something that I didn't see 10 years ago. I didn't see when I was a teenager. So I'm thankful that we have this opportunity to share experiences. I think as, as a mentor and as a woman in sports, we are responsible to motivate and to empower the next generation. And it seems like everybody here today is doing just that. So as long as we keep going and keep moving forward, I think we're just, sh you know, shedding and shattering all the, the barriers that have been placed in the past. And it's really optimistic and I'm proud to be a part of the movement. Yeah, and to piggyback on that, um, the same thing, like these type of opportunities haven't been around very long. And it, to me, it almost feels like a therapy session. I wish I could have listened to these women 10 years ago, even five years ago, even. And to understand that people's unprofessionalism wasn't my inadequacies. You know, if someone didn't email me back, I'm thinking, well, I wasn't good enough. Well, no, that person is unprofessional. And to hear you know, again, the women in these two days being able to talk and we're able to openly promote women in sports and have our own space, I think is such a huge step, um, hopefully to, to even make this next generation that much stronger. Um, and I hope it continues, but I also hope it's just, you know, like with racism in our country, I hope it's something we don't have to continue to discuss. It should just be normal, you know, and we shouldn't have to come together, but that's, you know, a pipe dream. And I'm just proud to be a part of something like this right now. I want to throw that out to the rest of the group. Where do you hope to see programming go in the next 10 years? What are your opportunities? Uh, yeah, I'll chime in on that. So because I've been around Girls on the Run a long time. I started as a volunteer back in 2002. So I have seen this um, incredible surge of interest in our program over the last 10 years. 
and when we think of when I when we see well we ask parents um, what they value the most about girls on the run and it's things like again building confidence what's most critical developing compassion kindness developing a healthy lifestyle that includes physical activity understanding her strengths and really nurturing her emotional health and so as I look to the next 10 years uh, I just don't think the need for any of those things will change. And in fact, I really think it's going to intensify, you know, sadly over the last four years, uh, and particularly in the last year with COVID, you know, we have seen the progress that girls and women have made in the fight for equity and social justice stall, you know, and even go backwards. And the, you know, the pandemic in particular has exposed weaknesses in our societal systems. And it's now furthering, uh, deepening, it's just deepening those pre-existing inequalities, particularly for our most vulnerable girls and women. So I just think it's critical for this generation of young women. I mean, you have got to dig in and do the important work of supporting and advocating for girl-focused programs over the next 10 years. We have just got to make up for the losses that have occurred, have occurred over the last four years. Does anyone else want to chime in on the evolution where you're hoping to see this go? I will. Um, making sure that we get the buy-in from uh, the school districts. So of course, Girls on the Run is an after-school program. Um, just making sure that the people at the top know how important this, this organization is and how it's going to develop their students and getting the, once we get the superintendent involved, uh, then it'll trickle down and now we're getting the parents involved. We're getting more volunteers so that we can open up in more schools and we'll have more teams. Um, my dream, and I'm sure it's my executive director's dream as well as Liz's, is to have one in, have a goater group in every school in San Antonio. That would be amazing. And just to see all these young women completing for most of them, probably their first 5K, they wouldn't dream of running three miles or walking three miles, skipping, hopping, whatever it is. Um, but it's all got to start from the top. And I think once we get that focus there and once it trickles down, there's no stopping us. Ago, my volleyball program at Alabama State took it on as their community service activity. And when I tell you, you talk about they actually took so much pride and joy in, in, in the community, it became a lifestyle for my man, especially my managers. They loved it. But even today, they've carried on that tradition and they really look forward to that program. I'm so happy to hear that. That's because that's what I said. It's got to be fun. <laughs> you know? And the adults love it just as much. I mean, we hear from our coaches all the time. Oh, I wish I'd had girls on the run when I was young. So or the adults are getting just as much out of it as the kids. That's great, Penny. Yeah, I was just going to say, I agree that, the, you know, these, these types of programs are going to be, we, we need them. We, we're going to still need them in 10 years. Um, and so my hope, and I'm like ch chiming in with what Lori said, my dream would be that there would be this like lots of funding that just comes out of somewhere to help all of these programs all around the country and beyond so that it can be really accessible to, to literally everybody. And, and personally, our, our program, we partner with universities so that student athletes, I train the student athletes so that they can teach and coach programs in their communities. And just the number of universities, like my dream would be that NCAA is, is you know, like every single university, you know, can have an opportunity to have a, a women's um, athlete network of some kind on their campus so that they can start be, you know, having these conversations like we are. Um, they're, they're at a great age to be empowered to lead that next generation and before they move on into the workforce too. So just to keep going, I just think we just need to keep going, you know, we keep going. And 10 years from now, 
you know, I, I would love to all get back together and we're still going to be probably doing this, you know, a lot of the same thing and then hopefully just scaling it so that we can reach more. There's always more people that I, I want to reach, you know, so um, I just, you know, keep, we just got to keep going, I think, you know. Thank you for that. For those that, that might be watching that are thinking about coaching for the first time um, or getting involved in mentoring for the first time, kind of how would they, what would be your advice in terms of plugging in and, and becoming a mentor? And what are some things you think that they're going to need in order to be an effective mentor or an effective coach? Um, so Ms. Penny, I'll start with you because I saw that you're, you're unmuted, you're ready to go. <laughs> Ask the question. There have never been a kid that have just emailed me and asked if I would be their mentor. I've never turned them down. And the problem is they think that collegiate coaches or whatever level, it doesn't matter. They think we're untouchable. And that's our life passion and purpose is that we give back, we hold the door open. We sit down, we coach, we teach, we nurture, we build up, we support, we walk in the gym, we watch you coach, but just somebody that you can bounce out ideas from. But the interesting part is I learn just as much from them as they ever could from me. It's, it's, it's just, it's a wonderful exchange, but I would tell them, don't be afraid to ask, just ask. Find someone you want to emulate and go and ask. Thanks. Anybody else want to chime in with, with advice on mentoring, coaching? How do people get involved in terms of working with young girls and, and young athletes? I'm happy to do that. So we rely on over gosh, 55,000 coaches each year to bring our program to life. Um, and a lot of those, that is primarily women. So I would say 95% of our coaches are young women and moms and teachers and everybody. So if you have an interest in getting involved and, and um, making a difference in the lives of elementary school girls, you can certainly go to, just go to our website and reach out for information. We are always recruiting and um, engaging coaches. We have a national coach training program. So even if you've never worked with kids before, we're gonna give you your toolkit too. So you're gonna get everything you need to go out there with confidence to be a real role model for these young girls. And you don't have to be a runner. I am personally not a runner. All you have to do have is just a passion um, for girls and, and wanting to do everything you can to empower them. So we would love to welcome you as a mentor to the girls in our program. Well, let me add this as well. You know, in, in college uh, athletics, we love for our kids to put in a certain amount of community service hours. So that is the most, um, I just think that's a great avenue for you all to send emails to every college that is near. I don't care what level, I think you will be overwhelmingly happy at how many how many different programs from different sports will really take that on because I think it's important that our student athletes get in the community and become great role models for all the little kids that end up coming and sitting in the gym on the track or on the field and watching them at their sport but I think for for them to go in there and empower and engage with and the thing is there is no NC2A rules. We can do it with elementary. We can do it with eighth grade below. There is no rules. So you know what I'm saying? So that would be wonderful. I would encourage um, you know, girls on the run to really shoot a letter to all those different coaches and ask. And I think you'll be surprised at the response that you'll get. Yeah, I, I agree. We've The universities are such a great avenue um, and the athletes are itching especially right now um, I think it can be kind of grounding a little bit for them to be involved in something like this because their world is a little bit shaken like everyone's and if there's competitions are not competing or seniors that are losing their season and to get them sort of 
to sweep, swoop them up and get them involved in something like this, where the young kids are like wide eyed, they're celebrities to them, you know? So um, similarly, you know, we, we rely on volunteers and um, we love our, our college athletic um, partnerships and those athletes to serve as volunteers, as well as some teachers and moms and parents and um, anybody that wants to really, we have some former college athletes that have graduated and are missing sport and want to get involved so they can start a program, things like, you know, things like that. So I would encourage, you know, to your point of how to, how to, how do people get that want to get involved, get involved. I would encourage them to look at some of these national programs like Girls on the Run, like Strong Girls United and there's so, and then also look locally and there's just, you know, speaking to the difference of 10 years ago and what Angela was saying too, I think there's just so many more programs now. So looking locally, looking at your, your uh, community service office from your university, if you're a college athlete um, or local recreation departments, if you're in the high school and just, you know, looking local and looking national and see, you know, just find a way to get involved. And like Penny has said, and Liz, and we've all said, when you do get involved, it's going to help you so much, probably as much or more than the little kids. So there's really, there really is like a, it's a two way street there, right? It's going to benefit you as well. Um, so we, we are happy to take volunteers um, as well. It's definitely what we, what we rely on. And we have been doing exactly um, what you said, Penny, is, is reaching out to those universities and finding ways to, to get involved in each, each of the university programs. Thanks for that. I, I want to ask a, a question about culture because I think this has come up again in this even early on in this panel discussion of hearing words like I can't or not necessarily seeing um, themselves represented. And so I'm curious about um, elements of culture that you guys build into either your relationships um, as a mentor with a mentee um, or the the the, the sport you're actually coaching in the program that you are um, developing. So a little tidbit about culture and what are your tenants that you try to infuse into everything that you do? I'd like to answer that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I feel I feel like it's kind of a discussion. We already mentioned, you know, because Lainey was talking about the earlier, the better, and Penny was talking about the self-talk. And I have an example from this two-year-old girl that I'm teaching how to swim right now and we were going to the deep end and she was scared and she was like I can't I can't and I said to her I'm like one second and we came up from the water she took off the goggles I'm like yes you can I'm like say I can't and she's like whispering I can and then I'm like what and she's like I can't and then I'm like what can you do she's like I can and then we like go underwater together and then that that kept coming up throughout the swim practice where she was doubting herself and she's two, you know, and so we were shifting that very early and then she got out of the pool with her parents and she was like, I can. And so it was really amazing to see a two year old kind of shift that self talk and be aware of it because I don't know where it came from, but um, Anyway, that's the kind of work that I do with some of the younger kids, all the kids, but especially the young ones that are that are starting to learn how to swim or starting to learn how to talk to themselves and talk to other people. I'll jump I in love on this that. One too. You, yeah, go ahead, Angela. You go first. Oh, no, go for it. Oh, <laughs> um, one of the things that we do, you know, because I still find myself saying, oh gosh, or you know, maybe it's just me or this is an us problem. And what our team does is that we're very intentional about checking each other and lifting each other up and saying, no, this is the right way or um, no, we can do this. You know, so much of the work that we do is really, um, is, is highly visible and, and can be highly scrutinized at times. Um, and we're always so careful because we're speaking on behalf of professional athletes and we want to be responsible with that. But, you know, there'll be times where people are just, again, unprofessional or difficult and we're still rising above that and making sure that we're over delivering and making sure that more importantly, we're on our group chats, helping each other and lifting each other up and reminding one another, like, no, we were responsible. We are doing this the right way. We are professional. And I think that helps me on a weekly basis. And I know it helps our team is, is having that cheerleader mentality um, internally and making sure that um, we're still supporting one another. That's great. The, um, I was thinking about the I can, um, Kim, and uh, one of the 
projects that I work with, uh, work on is with the Boston Children's Hospital for our cardiac fitness program. And the, the theme behind uh, this work that we're doing right now for this program is, uh, can two words transform healthcare and transform a kid's life? And the two words are, I can. <laughs> and you know, how do we teach, how do we teach going from I can't to I can? Um, so our tenants um, within our organization are teaching, we want to uh, empower and inspire and teach girls to find what's possible. And so possible is practicing mindfulness, overcoming obstacles, setting goals, spreading kindness, investing in gratitude. Um, let's see, investing, <laughs> believing in yourself, um, leading courageously and embracing a growth mindset. So those become our, those are sort of the tenants that are behind all of our, uh, the mentoring program and our, we have a one-to-one -one mentoring program and our sort of teams. When you talk about culture, the interesting about, thing about culture uh, and Angela, how often do you hire a new person? How often do you bring someone new on board? Is it, is it your group, the 10 of you all, and it's been that way for a while? That's a good question. Um, a core of the women that I work with are women I've carried with me for 15 years now in different jobs and capacities. The way I look at it is when I find someone who gets it and who is a team player, if I'm eating, they're eating. You know, and I've had um, some of the women who work for me were working for me for free during my broke management days when I was trying to make this happen. And that's been important. And that's been about five or so of those women. Um, and then because our work, um, again, we do a lot of the social impact work with athletes and it, it, it used to ebb and flow and now it's just flowing so much. And so um, we probably bring on a new person um, maybe once or twice a year um, on a project level, but then a full-time person, um, maybe once a year, if that, but we're really careful again on who we allow in our very safe, comfortable learning environment and making sure that it's the right fit again. So we stay healthy and productive and are the best for our clients. Let me tell you why I asked her that. Although she's in a very unique environment, the reason why I ask you, you, you heard how protective she was because she went from, you know, she said, when I eat, they eat, but she went on the days when things were scarce to where things are flowing. The reason why I say that is she had to establish a culture when things were scarce and it had to be with people that were going to be consistent, that was going to always uh, do what was best for the team and not what was best for them individually. Culture is dynamic. It's not static. It's like when every year when we start a new season, it doesn't matter that I just brought over the same 10 kids that was in last season's team and now only brought in two new players. The thing is, is the team chemistry and the culture has to restart and be reestablished all over again. That's why culture has to be something that we as leaders are very specific, very driven, very consistent in setting. And it has to be something that we're, we're actually, it's like investing in the root. And that's what she did. Uh, and Angela, I've been listening to you for the last two days. I want you to know that you rock. I totally enjoyed you yesterday, but she invested in the root. And when you invest in the root, you can enjoy the fruit later. So she laid that foundation. She nurtured, she grew that baby. She was impregnated with her gift, her purpose, what she was. You know what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? You knew what you wanted to do. You went in that office at San Diego State. You told them what you wanted. You made a difference. You were already unique in your own. So the culture that she has established, she's very protective in that because she doesn't want it to change. But when she brings people in, I think she make the bylaws, the guidelines, the standard of excellence, the work ethic, the attitude, the energy, very, very clear. And that's what, that's how you establish unique, successful teams is that leaders are real good at establishing culture. And that, that's a job because you got to be on it, diligent about it. But culture changes lives and programs. You can have the best team there is and your culture stinks, you ain't going to win. You ain't going to win. They're not going to win. But you can have an average team, 
with a wonderful team culture and you can achieve above than what you may look like you should have achieved on paper because of the leadership. You rock, Angela. So, can I add to that real quick? Because I have a really good point to that. You know, it, I think it's Oprah who says that she, in correct the quote if I'm wrong, when she says, there's nobody riding in my limo who won't push the bus when that limo breaks down. And my team, I mean, there were times I was, they were, like I said, there was one particular instance, um, one of my team members right now, she was working for free at the time when I was really trying to get this off the ground. And I was so broke, I was doing taste tests at Jack in the Box so I could get $60 cash. So I had cash to put gas in my car to drive to LA so I could get in front of two agents so they remember who Lachica was. So three years down the line, they had a client, they needed something, I was there. It was a steady hustle. And this one particular team member of mine right now, we, had, we were going on a little PR tour of, of New York and we used Southwest Airlines points and we did what we had to to get out there. But we had made business cards and we were walking through the streets of New York and she happened to drop them. And she picked up those precious business cards knowing I had spent the last dollars I had on it. You would have thought she was scraping $100 bills out of the streets of New York. And that told me that she is in it to win it and she has been working for me now with me now excuse me for five years and any like if i'm eating she is eating and that means so much to me and i hope that i continue to create the culture where you 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 teach them so they are capable of leaving but you treat them so they never will want to leave thank you so much um I, my question and i'll start with kim and then maybe we can go round robin um, I, I'm curious if you can, if you could give a shout out to a mentor or coach um, that basically inspired you to be where you are today. Who is that person and why do you hold them near and dear to your heart? Yeah, of course, there's so many. I mean, the two names that first popped into my head, uh, Cindy Gallagher, the head coach, the former head coach of UCLA, who mentored me and coached me to become an Olympian, and uh, Coach Terry McKeever who was the first female Olympic head coach. And both of those women just inspired me. They still inspire me to this day. I had coffee with Cindy a couple of weeks ago and I thank them so much for giving me the confidence and believing in me when I didn't believe in myself the way that they believed in me. And they've just paved the way for so many younger athletes and continue to do just that. Um, I love what Terry said when she was interviewed after being named the first female head coach of an Olympic swim team. And she said, I'm looking forward to the day when that's not even a question. And I was like, I love this woman. Thanks. Lori, I'm going to come to you next. Um, I have uh, two people that have just inspired me and have gotten me to where I am. And they were two of my high school coaches, um, Coach Carol Stevers and also uh, Miss Drakeford. Actually, I have three people and Coach Brenda Cofield, all from high school. Um, I went to high school in, in Germany. I'm a proud army brat. And you don't get a lot of exposure in, in Germany because you're confined you know, to a mili military base. Um, so you don't, you didn't get the exposure that you would stateside, but um, Coach Stever put into my head that I could be one of the best volleyball players ever. So at that time, and I'm dating myself, you couldn't tell me that I wasn't going to be the next Flo Hyman. You couldn't tell me anything. If you don't know her, young ladies, Google her. Um, so that drove me to, you know, practice harder, um, watch other girls who I, in my mind, I thought were better than I was. I and mean, then Coach Stever says, well, why do you think that? And I was like, well, look how high she can jump. You can do the same thing. You just have to apply yourself. So it was applying myself, getting that, that negative self-talk away from me um, and just progressing, practice, studying um, my sport. Um, and because of Coach Stever and on the basketball court, Coach Cofield and Coach Drakeford, um, I, I excelled 
and I ended up with a scholarship to Southern University, so shout out to the SWAC. And um, because of them, I got to play my dream of college volleyball. Didn't quite turn out to be that Flo Hyman type of player, um, but I was satisfied with what I had done. I had reached one of my goals and I did it. And it was because of those three ladies that I got there. Thank you. Well, that means Coach Denu was your coach? <laughs> I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Oh, nice. Um, Liz, how about you? I'm going to take a little different stance on this because I certainly had some great coaches when I was in high school. But Colette mentioned Billie Jean King in the last um, session we had. And so when I think of a moment that was just pivotal in my life and it really influenced my desire to be in this space. So I was 10 years old when the Battle of the Sexes tennis match between Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs took place. So that was in 1973. I know we got a, a lot of young people listening. So, but Billie Jean King was one of the greatest female tennis players in the world at that time. And Bobby Riggs was just this former player and older, but he challenged her with all this grandstanding and chauvinistic language about how women were inferior players. And so she accepted that challenge. And this, this match, I tell you, I mean, it was such a huge media spectacle. And I, I mean, there were like over 90 million people watching this tennis match. And it was just so incredibly inspirational to me. I'm 10 years old watching Billie Jean King just crush this guy, right? And the reason she accepted that match to even begin with was to shine a spotlight on pay and equity for women in professional tennis. And she fought tirelessly for women to receive the same prize money as men. And thanks to her, tennis is one of the few sports where the women's prize money is the same as the men. Um, so I think about that and I just can't even imagine the pressure she must have felt during that match as so much was on the line. You know, had she lost it, gosh, it would have been just such a setback for women's sports and women's equality, you know, and here she was just with determination and preparation and focus and inner grit, she stayed strong and she just kicked this guy's ass. And so I just think the lesson we can all take from her you know, we might not all be like these stellar, amazing athletes like Billie Jean King, but we each have the capacity to make courageous choices that are meaningful to us. And we can choose to prepare for whatever we endeavor to achieve and to focus our effort and attention on really what matters the most to us and to ultimately recognize that we each possess the inner strength to face whatever obstacles may block our way. You know, we just have to simply tap into the inner strength we have and just let it soar. So she was just a huge role model for me and really, oh, what a rock star Billie Jean King is and still you know, was and is. Thank you. Lonnie, you're next on my Hollywood Squares. I want to work for all of you. Like, can you all, can I, like, I'll coach with you. I'll coach volleyball. I'll coach girls on the run. Well, I want to work. I don't know anything about really what you're doing, Angela, but I would love to work for you. I'll, you know, <laughs> so you all are just awesome. Such an inspiration, but this is, you know, I didn't, I don't have one person to be honest, that just comes to mind. But what comes to mind is the fact that I had access and opportunity as a young child to play and to play lots of different sports. And, and, my, and that's, you know, my parents and situation and circumstances and um, just bringing, bringing me to high school. Like I remember being a young kid going to the high school basketball game, high school soccer games. And I could tell you where I sat in the stands with the blankets to watch these high school kids play and boys and girls. And I just loved, like, they were celebrities to me. And this is what I'm trying to sort of recreate. And when I coach the high school athletes, I'm, I remind them, you know, these, there's young kids in the stands that are watching you. And a week from now, they are not going to know what the score was of the game, but they are paying attention to your movement. They're paying attention to how are you reacting to ref calls? Are you, did you sprint to pick up your teammate when they were on the floor? Were you cheering from the bench, whether you were in, you know, when you weren't in the game? Like they're, these young, young kids are watching all of that. And so for me, a men, as a, in terms of like, you know, who was your mentor? I just think like, older women in sports, like 
those and and men and women, but especially the the women in sports in high school, college, just the opportunity and access to play and watch was my sort of like that that was my motivation and inspiration and and mentorship. Thank you so much, Angela. I have to apologize. The future is female here, and I. Sorry, I did. I missed the question. I apologize so much. Oh, no worries. Um, just wondering if, if you, who is your mentor, your coach that you'd like to give a shout out to on particularly mm. that's elevated mm. you and given you um, the courage and, and the confidence to be where you are today? Yeah, I think we'll do a coach to stay with the um, theme. And I think anybody who's heard me talk these last two days is coach Steve Fisher from San Diego State. You know, he, he, I had mentioned earlier, he was very old school and very traditional and had some bad experiences when he was at Michigan with the Fab Five and, you know, even just females in the athletic department and just didn't want me, flat out didn't want me around. And I tell him all the time that one decision to allow me to work with a team and give me a chance changed the trajectory of my career. And it set a tone for how the coaches treated me. It set a tone for when we'd go to um, to schools and on road trips, it, you know, if, if I remember one time we were playing um, Air Force and Air Force shared a men's locker room and a women's locker room with all the sports. And I had to come in and out just based on my job as a manager pregame. And the athletic director and the president of the school came in and told Fisher before the game, she's not allowed in here. And coach looked them in the eye and said, she's a part of this team. She needs to be in here. And they didn't say anything. And that was a really big deal coming from two years prior and him not even wanting me, you know, to set foot in the practice arena, frankly. Um, so I thank him. I credit him so much. Um, every time, you know, there's a recognition or something, I always credit to him. Thank you for sharing. Ms. Penny. My first coach, my life coach, my mom. Um, just somebody that was just the wind beneath my wings first coach and i thank god she's still here with us she's 87 years young and then you know my uh, elementary coach miss vivian carter the one that told me i could be great and then my high school coach myra manser who first saw the gift in me and went and learned how to coach volleyball to help me and then my collegiate coach ruth nelson so yeah yeah Thank you so much for sharing. But I think this is a, a time where we can turn it over and see if there are any questions from those um, that are watching or any burning questions for the panelists. Looks like we may not have any. So Ahada, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, I believe, to close this out. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, let's see, I don't think we have any questions in the chat. Hold on, let me make sure. No, we don't. We don't. So let me just tell you, this, this was awesome. This, once again, yet another um, awesome panel um, of, some, of some fabulous women um, who are just killing it, who are just killing it. And uh, Angela, I know you, you um, apologized for the baby being there, but I don't want you to apologize for that because I think that this is an example for girls to understand that this can be done. It can be done. Um, and if you know how to set a balance and you know how to prioritize and you know how to love unconditionally, um, that this is what it looks like. This is, this is exactly what it looks like. So, um, so thank you for, for a uh, baby showing up uh, and, and, and that it's okay, that it's okay. I think that our society sometimes says that it's not okay to do that. Um, and what we wanna offer to girls and to women everywhere is that it's absolutely okay. And, 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 it's, and whether you want to or you don't want to, either is okay. So thank you. <laughs>